How's it going, our church? Kyle here. I just want to tell you, you are in store for a wonderful message. Melanie is sharing what she has experienced and gone through of the passing of her husband and instilling hope and belief in the trust in God through that moment of chaos. I'm excited for you. Well, hi, everybody. Can we welcome Melanie Joy? We've, we've been in a collection on, on the topic of purpose, and John Gaines got us started. And uh, if you didn't get his workbook on discovering your purpose, it's out in the back there. But um, that got us started this, in this collection on trying to figure out what does God have for me? And as we were dialoguing about, about this collection, at some point, I got to thinking about the fact that today would be the one year anniversary of the day that your husband passed, yeah, Floyd. went to heaven. One year today, I can't, I can't believe it. At 10 o'clock in the morning, yeah? Um, you know, ish? Ish, we don't know for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I said, hey, why don't you come and talk about how to hold on to your purpose when you're going through hell? Because uh, uh, it's hell is is it, you're either coming out of hell or going into hell, right? Uh, life happens. It maybe are you depressed? Or is it what does that look? I can't tell. <laughs> They're like, oh, is this the happiest church in the two five three? Yeah, that's what they talk about. <laughs> uh, but happiness isn't uh, trying to ignore all the tough things it's overcoming all the tough things right, right, and right. so we we train to overcome and i i wanted melanie to come and help us yeah i'm just waiting for you to tell the truth fully the, uh, in, this in, opening. in what regard <laughs> because I just want to say too, I sit down there every week, right? As he gives me these jabs and I just have to take what it. Are you So this about? is my opportunity, come on, to give it back to him. <laughs> but what, what you really said was, yes, I think January 29th is gonna be a year and what you should do, you should take the kids and you guys should go and have the weekend off. Well, that this is was, what he said. That was the wrong idea. <laughs> and then he said, no, I think that we should talk, which is, which is true, which right. is living out your purpose, right? Yeah. I'm, happy I, to, I I'm declare, happy to do it. I declare in front of all these people, you can have next weekend off. Is that a good idea? Yeah. They don't seem that enthused about it. <laughs> They, so, they want you to work. Yeah, no, and, and, and that's what I'm called to do, right? If you have a Bible, turn to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is, a, is an interesting story. Religious people just want to make it, I don't know, it's kind of all about Ruth, but it's really a story about two widows, two people who thought their life was going to go one way, and then it took a left turn. And there are two, I, the, I was reading it not too long ago, and I had, I, in both verses, I thought of you. Not just because you're in this season of learning to be comfortable with the idea that you're a widow, but because when I read it, I thought, oh, uh, that connects me to Melanie. The first one is in chapter two. Can you show me that verse? Uh, no, that's chapter, yeah, oh, there we go. Chapter 1, and this is where this, this one man, Boaz, is observing one of the widows, Ruth. And he says, I, I, also, he says, I, know, I know you're a widow, but I also know everything you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I've heard how you left your father and mother in your own land to live here among strangers. May the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge reward you fully for all that you've done. And what I want to say, the first part I want to say is I'm proud of you. And may God bless you for how you've handled this year. And I think a lot of us are proud of you who have watched you in this journey, okay? Thank and you. I know this is hard, all kidding aside. Yeah. I know this is hard to tell this story and I know you secretly resent me that I'm making you do it. No, but, no, not at all. But the second verse, show me that other verse, would you? This is more about Naomi when she went home, the other widow, and she says, don't call me Naomi. Instead, call me Mara, uh, which means someone in pain, because the Almighty has made 
life very bitter for me. I went away in full, but God brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi, which means blessed or whatever, when God caused me to suffer? And that, that painful, when I read that, I think, I wonder, I guess I feel like I know the answer, but do you feel bitter? Do you feel like God emptied you instead of filling you up? Yeah, well, there's parts, you know, of course, when it first happens, you feel numb and shock, and then you feel like, oh, God, are you you know, I, I said to you that day, I think, like, am I cursed? You know, what? I just lost my father 60 days before, and now my husband and my, it felt like my family had no leadership, no papa for my kids, no dad for my kids. And then the bitterness changes from, you you know, grief is, there's so many, if you've, you know, when you lose someone, there's so many stages of, of grief, but there's also multiple losses. You are grieving for the father of your children, and then you realize, oh, I don't have a husband. Oh, I don't have a helpmate. Oh, I don't have the, like all of the different pieces. And so there's stages of different bitterness that you can become bitter in. I don't have that title anymore. I'm no longer a wife. I'm no longer that. Um, but then there's the sweetness that comes with that God has been so good and so faithful to give us a sweet for the bitter. Are you angry at God, though? I mean, honestly, we all love you. Do you, do you kind of just want to give God the middle finger and walk away at any point in this journey? No, no. <laughs> I'm not that means f- yes, okay? No. Did, did you catch that? That's when women do that, when they're like, no, that means, <laughs> that means yes. But go ahead, explain the yes. I, want, I just am really confused by God, and I've talked out loud, like, I don't understand this plot twist. I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand why, you know, we're, we're trying to do everything we can. We're raising our kids. Not per- we don't have a perfect family or a perfect marriage, but we're trying to do things right. I'm trying to live out my purpose and my calling, and, you know, I, w- this is, what? Why this? I was engaged two other times. You know, it's just like, I felt like God, like you sent Floyd and he was the right man and yes, he is. And, um, but what now for all of that, for this to be taken of everything and to take my dad and take my husband and what? Like, I just, I don't understand. Like, I don't understand. I, I want to focus on purpose and how you kind of have held on to your purpose, even though your definition of yourself had to change. Right. But quickly, because you've made a lot of new friends this last year. Yeah. There are some people who have never, they never met Floyd. Yeah. They've never known you as, as a married person. So uh, for people who don't know the story, what happened 365 days ago? Um, I came home. I was away for the night with my mom and my daughter. And we went to a girls weekend in Seattle and we came home. And Floyd had Giovanni, my son, three years old, by himself. And we're calling and we're on our way home. And he was, I needed to get home to take over because he was headed to see a, watch a Chiefs game, go Chiefs. And, um, <laughs> and he wasn't answering, wasn't answering, wasn't answering. And I thought, oh, that's odd. Giovanni's giving him a run for his money. And then we pulled up to the house and I couldn't get in the house. The door was locked from inside, but his car was there. And then I start pounding on the door like, gee, Ma- Floyd. Because, because you start sensing this is weird. Yeah, the blinds were all closed. You know, there was, we always open our windows. The, the door, they weren't answering. And so I, I thought, okay, maybe he like fell. Maybe something has happened. Um, but I didn't know. What? So I called 911. The only thing I needed to do was call 911 to say, I can't get in my house. My husband's in there. Something's going on. And I didn't know. My son was in there. What was giving, welling me up even more was that my son, my three year old son, was silent, completely silent on the other end of his mom pounding on the door. And um, so then I called you and said, Something's wrong. I don't know. Like, I can't, you know, friend. I don't even know what I said, but something's happening. And um, the next day, I know the police are there, and they're. I, he, well, in one of the little miracles, I mean, there, there. This is a very sad story, but one of the little miracles is the guy, the the officer who shows up attends here. Yes. And he, we've known him for years. Yeah, and, twenty years. Uh, so he's a friend. He's a friend, and, and he, he wasn't on the call. I mean, Me- meaning what? He wasn't the one they dispatched, but they he heard it. He heard it on the radio, yeah. and he came because he knows you and loves yeah. you. And so Victor shows up, and he and he's he's got your best interest at heart. Right. He knows you. He knows Floyd. And, yeah. Um, 
And then I, I get there. By the time I get there, they've already found Floyd. Yeah. And Victor, in his wisdom, you know, I'm trying to run in the house and Victor wouldn't let me, you know, there was already someone there that was like, you're not coming in this house. You know, he didn't know what was, and he went down, found Floyd, died, and Giovanni was sitting next to him, perfectly still, three years old, and he carried Giovanni and put him in my arms. And, the, and he was okay. The miracle that he's okay, yeah. right? And we had to say that a lot to each other, yeah. okay? Because you get sad about losing that, Floyd. Yeah. But as I said to you four million times, the baby's okay. Yes. Yeah, and a miracle. And this is a coping technique, by the way. You can use it. It's free. I'll give it to you. Uh, instead of obsessing about what you lost, rejoice over what you've got left. Because it's not, even that's not for sure, right? Right. And people that rehearse past losses get sadder. People that rehearse past victories get more motivated. And so, uh, hallelujah, the baby's okay. Yep, yep. And by the way, I said to you, I think at the time, if Floyd could choose between himself or Giovanni, he would have chosen oh, himself absolutely, absolutely. To, to go to heaven. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's what he would have wanted yeah, to if yeah. he had to choose. Yeah. So that's the story there. Yeah, and, and shock, and you know, and then we didn't know what happened, and found out through an autopsy, thankfully, that it was myocarditis. So it was instant, and you know, a lot of people have just dropped dead. Yep. yep. And so from that moment on, what's the initial emotion? Two, give me two or three words that. Because uh, you're not thinking, okay, well, I can do this. That's not your first reflex. Your no. first, no. the first response is, I'm not doing this. <laughs> I don't want to do this. This is a mistake. And and you're numb. You're like, how is this? And I, I have said this to people, and I've then now repeated it to other people. I've been able to walk through that this is as bad as it seems. Because you said that to me the next day. Because sometimes people... I wasn't trying to bring you down. No, no, Don't no, no, make no. me look bad in front of these people. <laughs> but you need to be reminded, some people think, you know, they think the world is, the sky is falling down, and it's not. You, it's a toenail, right? right. And you got to keep going. And other people need to, no, this is bad, but um, you, can, you can do this. You can keep going. And I didn't feel like I could do it. I didn't feel like I could be a single mom. I didn't yeah. feel like we could. Um, and so a lot of numb and bitter and yeah. shock, and then turned into, okay, how are we going to do this? My, uh, just, I, I've been with, I've been, uh, you know, on the scene of suicides, car accidents. Uh, you know, I've been in divorce court with people, uh, DUI court. I mean, the nature of this work is you, you're there for the saddest moments and the happiest moments of people's lives. What I was trying to tell Melanie is, I think a lot of times when we're trying to make people feel better, we don't want to think about it, so we say dumb things. We said, oh, it's, it's okay, it's going to be fine. <laughs> it wasn't going to be fine, right? It's not, he's not coming back. It's as bad as it seems. The scripture says something that uh, to, to quickly agree with the devil so that you can overcome him. This is a very unique thing. When he makes an accusation against you, agree with him and say, that's right, I am a sinner, but God has forgiven me. Right? We don't say, no, I'm not a sinner. We agree with, with the truth, who, whatever mouth it comes out of. And then we build on top of it, right? So what I was trying to help Melanie with is, this is as bad as it seems. And the second part was... You're going to thrive and you're going to get through it. We're going to make it. Yeah, you're going to make it. But you're in that... I mean, I had so many crazy thoughts. You know, I wasn't sleeping for weeks. I wasn't... I mean, I think I said to you, I'm like, do, I hadn't seen him. I'm like, is he really gone? Do you think he's really dead? Do you think... I mean, I went through so many scenarios in my head that you had to have that jolt back to reality. And... Um, and that, and the good, the sweetness is that you're going to survive, that you're up and you're living and your baby's alive and there's purpose and you still have, you have a new season. It was, there was humor in the middle of this, I have to say, when she's saying, do you think he's really dead? Like it's Tupac or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> or, I had a whole... <laughs> or Elvis, like is he, yeah, like, 
I don't, I don't think he's, I don't think this is an elaborate ruse. I did ask you seriously. Yeah, though. I, know, I, I like, know you were serious. I'm just saying it was funny. I tried not to laugh at you, but what? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. What, um, what is it? This weekend is interesting to me. How many, like somebody lost their dad? Uh, there was a family here last night. They lost their 23-year-old son. A mom last night, their 14-year-old son died on a soccer field. Yeah. Uh, some people showed up last night high, mm -hmm. uh, relapsed. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? People yeah. are going through stuff. Yeah. yeah. You said to me once that this has made me realize I don't have the corner on pain. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, I'm not the only one going through something. And then I think it wasn't even 24 hours after Floyd died. I didn't want to stay at the house. And so we were staying at the hotel down at Ruston. And I was in the elevator with the kids. This other family's in the elevator, other mom and son. And she's like, oh, well, you know, where are you from? I'm like, oh, from Tacoma. Oh, are you here on a staycation? I said, yeah, kind of, kind of. You know, I didn't know what to say. I said, what are you doing here? And she said, my home burned down last night and we lost everything. And I'm here with my son, and we don't, I don't know what I'm doing here. I just had no place to stay. I don't know what to do. It was during that time that Rustin, they had all that, the arsonist was going around. Don't make Rustin seem all, these people who live in Furcrest <laughs> and University Place. Have you noticed University Place people? They want to act like it's Beverly Hills. Uh, <laughs> Rustin, they had an arsonist <laughs> burning down houses. It is. It's a little nicer over here, I have to say. <laughs> is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> Whatever. But she, she stared at me and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, this mom is here. She has lost everything, you know, that she thinks. And I felt like right. I lost everything. And I thought, the Holy Spirit said, yeah, you're not going to be the only one going through something, yeah. little girl. Everybody. Is this, so is this is one of the takeaways for you, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That you, to find your purpose. Yeah. Before, I mean, I, I think a lot of people, if they would have looked at Melanie, what's the smile for? No, go ahead. Go ahead. What are you afraid of? <laughs> I think they would have said she had a charmed life, right? You're an only child. You were well loved. You don't want me to use the word spoiled. <laughs> but you, Last hour was a little brutal, I have to say. But go ahead. Well, I mean, you, you had a, you've had a good life. Yeah. And my parents, you know, my mom's here this morning, my dad, you know, they worked hard. Yeah. Hard to give me a great life. For sure. Yeah. yeah. For sure. I just, and it I, would, I'm saying with people saw you, they would go, this, this is, a, she's blessed. Yes. In fact, you said to me once after a devotion I gave, I was in my 20s, one of the first staff devotions I gave, he said, that was great, but, you know, I just want you to think about People, I'm afraid people are going to think of you as all fluff and no substance. And again... Again, you make me look bad in front of these people. <laughs> hard at the time, but truth and love, right? But I was because, trying to help you, Yeah, right? because I had pain, but I didn't share it. And that is how I'm different, is that, you know, I am someone now that is propelled and sharing pain because that's all that's what I have to give right now and there's been gold in that and I've connected with more people and been blessed by more friendships and love and been able to walk alongside people by sharing my pain than I have my win wins or accolades or you know anything and so um, there was pain there for sure in early but I wasn't I didn't have a way to share it or articulate it. Right. And the thing about, I think someone, someone famous once said, you know, pain is a megaphone. And I've thought of pain as a spotlight now. And it really, it puts a spotlight on what's going on. And so if there's a spotlight there, you're going to, you're going to see it and you have one choice. And if I can have a spotlight of pain and tell people about Jesus and how we're not perfect and we keep going, but it's just by the grace of God, it's a miracle a day then I guess that's what we're going to do. Yeah, and you've done that. I, I, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. And, and how you've handled this. When, uh, uh, talk about, because everybody out here is struggling too, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and they're trying to turn stumbling blocks into building blocks, like all of us. Yes. So they get laid off, and then they try to say, how, how can I learn from this? How can I build a better? They go through a divorce. Mm -hmm. 
and that feels like rejection. You, this the stuff that yeah. happens. Yeah. You get you get you think you finally get it together, and then you get a cancer diagnosis. There's a lots of ways that the people either watching online or in this room go through hard times. Um, and sometimes that leads to suicide. Yes. Because you try to you get make two steps forward and then one step back. Talk about that. How how you've processed like, okay, I'm moving forward and then then the enemy tries to steal joy. Yeah. Well, you know, we talk about checking on your people, check on your people, check on your people. And I think we could do better at checking on our people, yes, but we could also do better just being raw and sharing what's going on, sharing the pain so that you know that there's painful. But um, I was so taken, this is probably, I was six months in um, to Floyd being gone and I'm still not sleeping and up at three in the morning, scrolling through social media, you know, tap, 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 to, you, see, you see someone's profile and you're like, oh, where's that? And I came across this ministry called Never Alone Widows, which is specifically a ministry for widows that have lost a spouse under the age of 50. And I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't know this existed. And I looked, they had hundreds of thousands of followers, groups all on the East Coast, you know, that groups that people could get involved in, and retreats and conferences. And I thought, this is amazing. How can I be involved? How can I help? Nothing on the West Coast. And so I just decided to send them a message because honestly I was also in a point of desperation like how are these women they look they look great uh, how are they thriving and what is this like and I could could I be a part of it and so I sent a message in the middle of the night this is my story I'm a pastor I'd love to help love to know more and didn't think you know maybe someone would see it so many followers the next morning I get a message and um it was from Rachel Faulkner Brown, who has become a friend. She's the founder of the ministry. And I was shocked. And she said, Melanie, the Holy Spirit woke me up last night and told me to go to our social media account, open the messages, and that there was something there that I needed to read. I never look at the messages. My, our team does that. You know, I never go on the account. And she said, and I read your story. I can't believe it. I'm going to be in Seattle in three weeks. Uh, do you have time to meet? Awesome. And I said, yes. She's going to be for 24 hours. So I, I met her, drove up there. We sat down, and for three hours, this woman just poured life into me. It was like someone had, was finally speaking a language I understood. There she is. She's in her mid-50s. She's been widowed twice. Okay, first husband died of heart attack. Second died in the line of certain duty. And um, she's married and pastoring, and she just spoke life over me. She, you know, you're going to do this. You're going to be a blessing to other widows. You're going to get married again. Your kids are going to thrive. You're going to... Every fear that I had, she was speaking to, and I was crying and she was crying and um, I asked her if I could be a part of it and she said yes and can I start a group here and it was just wonderful and I dropped her off at her hotel I was sad to see her go it was just three hours of golden I but I was on a high it was like the best drink of water in a desert I could have had because I'm like I'm gonna do this I'm gonna ha I'm gonna speak to widows and we're gonna do life together and gosh God's gonna go and look at this miracle and I was just so excited I'm gonna tell my story and I was on I was calling my mom on the freeway called you like this woman it's amazing and so I was thrilled and then I came to church and um, like life does it just kind of hits hits you and we had a, a guest speaker and they're talking about their stuff and he's you know he says you know Jesus asks us to care for the widow and orphans and do you know why he asks us to care for the widow and I am on the edge of my seat and I'm so excited and he said because widows are the only person class of people that have nothing to offer I was like sitting right there like crestfallen and mad and I don't hurt. think that wasn't that obviously that wasn't meant to hurt. No, 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 it no. Was no. It was you, sometimes you say things you don't realize how totally, it hurts. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought I, I was mad, you know, but then it really yeah, that. Uh, stop right there. Who were you mad at? I was mad at you. Yeah, he was. I didn't, I didn't even say it, but no. she was blaming me. Of course. There's so many lessons here today. <laughs> because, yeah, you know, you get mad at people. I had someone, I needed someone to win. But I thought, you know what? That is what the world tries to do to everyone. Get this. That thinks get they this. have nothing to offer. 
They think, I have nothing to offer. I'm divorced. I've gone through a bankruptcy. I'm, I'm you know, fighting cancer. And the world would try to say, no, you have nothing to offer with that pain. And I would say to you, yeah, that's a lie because you're right. The only thing as a widow I have to offer is my pain. That's it. And that is how I connect with people. And that's how you can connect with people. That's how we all can connect through, with people is through our pain. It's not through the things that have gone right. It's through everything that has gone wrong. And by the grace of God, we're up and we're breathing and we're doing one more day and believing for better and can walk through people. I have had the honor of walking alongside people. Some are here this morning that have lost their husband, that have lost their dad. I'm in a group with kids at Mary Bridge. Um, they have a group called Bridges. And um, Donna, and she's lost, she's one, she, her son went to heaven. And um, this, this group in the Pierce County has a waiting list of kids to get into that have all lost a parent. And I'm in there with those women and those widows and we all have something to offer. I have something to offer them that are sitting there with no hope. They've never heard about Jesus. Um, and so if we could offer our pain and it was just a reminder and it was it lit a fire in me that I am good. I have something to offer. Yes, I do. And um, it doesn't look pretty, but it's what I've got. And we're going to share our story. And by the God, we're going to keep doing it. You, know? you are a woman of substance. Thank you. You are. <laughs> you. you are. I got, we have a lot of people here who have already asked for their miracle. Yeah. Did you write one up here? Yeah, I wrote it right over there. It's like a, what do you want them to know? Because in just a second, I'm going to pray over everybody. And they're going to come up. And it won't be about your story. Right. It's going to be about their story. Yeah. So some of them are separated. Last night, someone was here going through a fresh divorce. Another person is getting sued. This week they got sued. So... Uh, there's a lot happening out here. Yeah. And I, I don't even know every, but those are just the people I talk to uh, who are going through tough times. Uh, I don't even know everybody who's going to watch it online right. around, the, around the world. But what do you want them to know? I, I want you to know that you're not, after you go through pain and a trauma, you're not the same person. You know, I'm not the same Melanie I was 365 days ago. My purpose has stayed the same. The person I am has changed. And so even though you've gone through trauma, even though you're a different person, even though you've gone through that divorce or that depression, you, your purpose remains even though your person has changed, right? And so don't get caught up and stumbled by, I'm not the same person, I can't do that, no, 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 no. That's right, you're not the same purpose, person, but your purpose remains. And so the new person that Jesus is creating in you every day, his mercies are new every day, he's doing something new every day, is beautiful and purposeful and you have if there's breath in your lungs you have something to give and you have purpose so keep going with your purpose even though your person looks different and then I would also say you know gratitude just has changed everything for me tell, tell them about this little prayer yeah the prayer that my kids sing you know we sing it every night for their prayer time thank you God God our Father for every blessing for every blessing <laughs> And we sing it, my mom, the two kids and I, we sing that as our prayer. And it has changed the way my children see life because we're thanking Jesus. We're in a, you know, we're there without daddy, but we're thanking Jesus for how good he is. Our talk time this last week, our grief talk time after group was, talk about at the family dinner table, you know, everything that has changed, everything that's different since daddy went to heaven. And so I asked Rosary to list, you know, tell me everything that's changed. And I, I was ready for the list, you know, of all the things that were missing with daddy. The first thing was, well, the cooking is not the same. <laughs> True. He was a good cook. He was the best. Yeah. I can only make reservations. Um, I'm trying. But then everything after that was, well, we live in a house that's closer to school. We get to live with Gigi. I get to do this. Now I have new friends at Grief Group. I've, and every single thing she listed in her little beautiful six-year-old mind um, was positive. Of everything that was positive. And I was expecting it to be, you know, the negative. And only God can do that. Only gratitude that Jesus has instilled the Holy Spirit. Nothing that I've done 
so imperfect, but the Holy Spirit has instilled into this little girl's um, is gratitude, and she can and she defines this year as every good thing that God has done instead of what she's lost. Love it. I love it. Would you thank Melanie for sharing her pain today? Thank you, young lady. So good. Let's stand to our feet. Listen, listen, uh, ask for your breakthrough and it might have, it probably will have something to do with your pain. I'm going to ask the response team to come up here. These are friends. They've been, all been through stuff just like you have. Okay. We don't uh, allow any of the perfect people to be on response team. Uh, but there's also going to be these pens up here. Can you hand me one, dear? And I, I wrote, here's what I did. You don't have to do it my way. But I found a particular part of the stage here where I knew if, if I had a miracle, my miracle happen in July, I would know where to go. So pick a spot on the stage. And, and what people have written here, healing for wounds, to hear clarity, breakthrough surgery, for a job, for a home, praying for my son to continue to grow, to find my husband. desire you instead of addiction. So these people have all been through something. The great disservice of religion is when we all get together and pretend to be perfect. The great service of Jesus is that he says nobody's perfect anyway. <laughs> so I pretend we all need him. So let me pray for you. I want you to go enjoy a great weekend. I hope to see you next weekend. But before you go, come and grab one of these pens. If you need to talk to somebody, talk to somebody. God, I thank you for Melanie. I thank you for pain. Pain is, as Melanie taught us, is a megaphone to a deaf world. So may we use our pain to help other people. We don't have to live in grief. We don't have to live in depression. We don't have to live in anxiety. We don't have to live in poverty. We don't have to live in sickness. We go through those things. We go through those places, but we do not live there. We live in gratitude. We live in faith. We live blessed despite the circumstances. I pray a blessing on every person here, whether they're a believer, an atheist, an agnostic, a Buddhist, a Muslim, whatever faith they walked in with, may they walk out thanking Jesus, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Make it a great day. Come up. I'm going to put this pen down. Grab one of these pens. Find a place on this stage. Come and pray with somebody. Make it a great day. What a phenomenal word from Melanie and Pastor Dean that was. I hope it truly inspired hope in you and impacted your life. And all experience long this weekend, we have people writing their miracles on stage. So in the comments below, I ask that you just write a miracle that you're believing for and praying for so we can partner with you. Love you, church.